1989, the Cold War was supposed to end. The Soviet Union, its economy stagnant, seemed ripe for collapse. Amidst low productivity, limited consumer goods, rising inflation, and a host of other problems, came increased pressure for significant political and economic reforms. Within the Soviet-dominated Warsaw Pact, demands for democracy and economic liberalization threatened to topple the ruling communist governments, while the military alliance as a whole seemed at risk of coming apart. Spurred into action by the seriousness of the situation, the Soviet Union had over the previous year entered into an unprecedented series of high-level talks with the United States and its NATO allies. The Malta summit, however, would end in abject failure, with Western diplomats walking out in protest over Soviet terms. The Soviet Union accused the United States of refusing to loosen the stranglehold it had imposed through trade restrictions and technology embargoes, even when presented with highly favorable terms. The United States and NATO, by contrast, saw Soviet demands for economic concessions, nuclear disarmament, and localized military withdrawals as nothing more than thinly concealed demands for foreign aid, cloaked in diplomatic rhetoric and carrying with them the threat of military action. Ironically, perceived NATO intransigence in the face of genuine Soviet offers became a powerful political tool across the Warsaw Pact, valuable ammunition to communist hardliners. Struggling to maintain their own legitimacy amidst growing unrest, several communist governments successfully redirected the prevailing discontent across Eastern Europe towards the United States. This anger was reflected within the Kremlin itself, which slowly but surely saw the ongoing talks with the West no longer as a means to reach a beneficial settlement with its ideological rivals, but as camouflage for their new military objective. The strategy was called Maskarovka, and its unprecedented success would finally unleash the conflict that had been inevitable since the first Soviet and American soldiers had met at Elbe River in the ruined heart of the Third Reich. It would unleash the Third World War. On the 3rd of June, 1989, American, British, and French forces in West Berlin were subjected to an enormous artillery barrage, inflicting widespread casualties. Timed perfectly to coincide with the strikes, the Berlin Wall, the most potent symbol of the Iron Curtain, was detonated by a series of pre-placed explosives. The way was cleared for Soviet army divisions to enter the Western occupation sectors of the city. Soviet forces assigned to this initial spearhead attack represented the elite of the Red Army, veterans of Afghanistan who were highly motivated and confident of a swift victory. Allied resistance in Berlin was initially fierce, but blunted by Soviet special forces groups that had been secretly deployed to the Western sectors over the previous 24 hours. Spetsnaz units, veteran members of the vaunted Alpha Group, had succeeded in disabling many of the most advanced NATO anti-air emplacements, creating a critical vulnerability in the city's defenses. The air forces of the Soviet Union and German Democratic Republic exploited this, achieving an early supremacy over the city and hampering NATO efforts to supply or support their forces. For hours, Western units fought a gradual retreat, withdrawing to predetermined firing positions in accordance with defense plans that had been constantly refined and updated since 1958. Despite a brief counterattack near Moltke Bridge that threatened to seriously blunt the Soviet advance, the lack of NATO air power, and the overwhelming Soviet numerical advantage was too much for the city's defenders. Though NATO planners had hoped that delaying actions could prolong the fighting for as long as 72 hours, Allied forces in West Berlin had capitulated in under a day. At the onset of hostilities in Berlin, Soviet army groups and their Warsaw Pact counterparts launched a coordinated offensive into Western Europe. The long-expected advances through the Fulda Gap and the North European Plain 
expanded into sustained Soviet breakthroughs, in which the vast numerical superiority of communist forces again proved decisive. By the end of the first day, the Warsaw Pact was advancing steadily through the Federal Republic of Germany, along multiple different axes, concentrating on Nuremberg, Frankfurt, Hamburg, Aachen, and Bremen. Within the first week, Soviet armies had reached the River Rhine. Despite heavy losses in certain areas, the attack had been a monumental success, meeting or surpassing even the most optimistic pre-war military simulations. NATO plans to reinforce air corridors into Berlin and achieve air superiority over East Germany quickly proved unrealistic. With neither side willing to resort to nuclear weapons, and NATO at a severe disadvantage, its member states attempted to merely slow down the Soviet advance, while an American-led counterattack could be mobilized and coordinated in France. Perhaps most importantly, the resolve of NATO remained intact. Soviet hopes of trading conquered territories for an armistice and peaceful settlement went unrealized. As NATO scrambled to sustain its positions in Europe, and the Warsaw Pact now fully committed to a large-scale war, the Soviet Union attempted to build on its initial successes and momentum. As its forces in Central Europe prepared to cross the Rhine and drive into France and Italy, it concurrently expanded the war into several new theaters. In Scandinavia, the Soviet Union quickly defeated the Finnish army and even managed to secure Sweden's capital of Stockholm in a surprise amphibious assault. In the Mediterranean, both the US 6th Fleet and the contingent of the Royal Navy were decimated, while in the Middle East, the Soviets turned on their one-time Arab allies, securing vital oil-producing regions in Iran and Iraq. By August of 1989, the Soviet Union had achieved stunning triumphs on multiple different fronts. Despite their successes, however, Warsaw Pact forces were increasingly encountering difficulties in transitioning the war to a new phase or forcing a decisive conclusion. Soviet advances into France and Italy were repeatedly delayed as supply columns were decimated by NATO air power, while American reforger convoys crossing the Atlantic slowly strengthened battered NATO units. The fragility of the Soviet Union's position as it worked to consolidate its gains was exposed during the first attempted Soviet invasion of France. Circumventing the main defensive lines in Central Europe, a smaller Soviet amphibious force landed at Marseille, a desperate attempt to draw the French army away from its northern borders and give the Soviet army group there the opportunity to advance. Though initially successful, with dozens of cities, including Paris, subjected to air raids, French and American reinforcements prevented any Soviet breakthrough, forcing the withdrawal of their remaining forces. As both sides awaited the start of the next pivotal campaign in Europe, the conflict continued to escalate throughout the remainder of the world. In Africa, the Americas, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific, nations aligned with either the Soviet Union or the Western Bloc became active participants in the conflict. Their motivations varied, with some countries genuinely embracing the ideological struggle represented by the war, while others saw it as an opportunity to secure superpower support for their own interests. Though not yet ready for a large-scale assault into the Soviet Union, by October 1989, NATO had begun to conduct raids and precision strikes within Soviet territory. Two of the most successful operations of this type included the destruction of nuclear power stations near Murmansk and the Soviet naval base in Polyani. Sinking Soviet nuclear submarines was a key objective for NATO, whose own naval forces had proven shockingly vulnerable. That same month, the American Navy achieved its first decisive victory, annihilating the largest Soviet battle group that had maneuvered its way through the GUIK gap and had been threatening the reforger convoys in the Atlantic. This, however, was largely overshadowed by Soviet submarine attacks against American naval bases in Virginia and even an attempted raid on New York City. The Battle of New York was particularly brutal, in which three companies of Spetsnaz threatened a chemical attack on the city unless the Americans withdrew from Europe. 
neither the attacks on Virginia or New York were successful, but shattered the illusion that the continental United States would be free from enemy action. Determined to prevent the reforger convoys from shifting the balance in Europe, the Soviet Union embarked on another desperate gambit. In an operation of dizzying scope and brazen audacity, it clandestinely transported several divisions worth of troops and equipment with an unmarked civilian cargo ships. Their destination was Seattle. Though the force would be almost entirely unsupported after it landed, its resupply dependent on whatever could be acquired throughout the occupied territories, it was hoped that the presence of a significant Soviet battlegroup on the mainland United States would force the redeployment of American divisions from Europe. Astonishingly, the Soviet force was able to slip through the remnants of the US Pacific Fleet and its allies in the region, landing in Seattle on the morning of November 9th, 1989. Washington National Guard units stationed in the city and the Seattle Police Department were almost immediately overwhelmed. Having achieved the element of surprise and establishing a beachhead into the city, the Soviet Air Force performed a secondary airborne landing, further reinforcing communist forces with badly needed supplies and elite airborne units. The invasion of Seattle was a miracle of modern warfare and a military disaster for the United States. The Soviet Union had captured a major American city and provided a center for further military operations across the whole of the West Coast. A new front, an American front, had been opened. Hastily reorganized into ad hoc formations, the US Army and Washington National Guard conducted a fighting retreat from Seattle, ceding both Puget Sound and Tacoma to the advancing Soviets. Though exhausted at every level from near ceaseless contact with the enemy, the arrival of US Navy assets, including the only recently reactivated USS Missouri, prevented American resistance from collapsing entirely. Soviet forces were also harried by local militia groups and partisan forces, leading to brutal reprisals against the local civilian population. A major objective of the Soviet advance into Washington was Fort Teller, home of the Strategic Defense Initiative. The Soviet Union was largely unclear as to the capabilities of the so-called Star Wars project, and it was feared that if Fort Teller were to be captured, the risk of a nuclear exchange would be dramatically heightened. Stretched to their very limits, the surviving US forces in the state managed to halt the Soviet advance at Cascade Falls but only after bitter fighting and the use of an American tactical nuclear strike. Though many costly battles had been fought across the state of Washington, by the spring of 1990, the perseverance of the American defenders had seized the initiative away from the Soviets. The supply issues had finally caught up with the landing forces, which now suffered from a lack of ammunition, replacement parts, and other critical supplies. In March of that year, the People's Republic of China finally entered the war, siding with its ideological allies in the Soviet Union. Its first major operation was to attempt to reinforce the Soviet positions in Seattle and Washington. The US Pacific Fleet, now in the midst of fierce fighting in the East China Sea, could not prevent the landing. Only the redeployment of American divisions from Europe would be enough to stop the People's Liberation Army, but doing so would play into the Soviets' ultimate aim, to weaken NATO forces defending France and Italy. The American operation to retake Seattle before the Chinese reinforcements could arrive was undertaken amidst the threat of terrible consequences should the counterattack fail. The timing of the operation was critical, for if it appeared that the PLA was about to land, the city was to be destroyed by a second nuclear attack on American soil. A scattered coalition of the Washington National Guard, battered US Army units, and what few fresh reinforcements could be mustered, swept into the city. Losses were severe on both sides, but when the PLAN fleet finally appeared off Puget Sound, Seattle was liberated, and American anti-ship artillery forced the Chinese to call off their landing operation. As the Third World War enters its second year, it is clear that the dramatic campaigns and operations of 1989 
have only served to heighten the intensity and scope of the conflict. With a quick victory no longer possible, both sides, bruised but not crippled, are forced to prepare for a war of attrition. In Europe, NATO is bracing for the long overdue Soviet drive into northern France and Italy, a sweeping offensive that will likely involve Hungarian troops, expanding the conflict into neutral Austria. In Scandinavia, remnants of the Norwegian, Swedish, and Finnish armies fight alongside partisans and guerrillas, eager to make the Soviet occupation of their lands as costly as possible. In Africa, local conflicts erupt with newly supplied arms, while the Pacific is once again the site of enormous naval engagements and amphibious landings throughout mainland China, Taiwan, Japan, and Korea. Even North America has become a battleground, and though the first two Soviet assaults have been countered, there is no guarantee that a third might not be on the horizon. In 1989, the Cold War was supposed to end. Instead, it became the first year of a new world. A world in conflict. In High Command, the Template Institute investigates the greatest battles, conflicts, and wars from across alternate worlds. If you've enjoyed this video and would like to join the Template Institute, consider pledging to our Patreon page. Along with increased security access, you'll be able to vote in polls to determine future topics, get custom wallpaper every week, and receive some other exclusive rewards. 